The sugar rush. What is it and how is it supposed to work? It's a theory pretty much everybody has heard. Powering down a load of sugar increases your blood sugar level, gives you loads of energy, and results in hyperactivity. So when you give a child jelly and ice cream, it's no surprise they're suddenly bursting full of energy that needs to be expelled. The end result, as any parent will tell you, is that they run around, go crazy, and cause chaos. Except that's not the whole story. In fact, it's not even the whole truth. So just what exactly is going on? I'm Stu, this is Debunked, and we're here to sort the truths from the myths and the facts from the misconceptions. Now, in part, this theory is correct. When we eat sugar, enzymes in the small intestine break it down and it is then turned into glucose. The liver then releases it into our bloodstream and it's transported to our organs and muscles and is then converted into energy. So surely this is how the hyperactivity occurs. The more sugar we eat, the more energy we get, right? Well, no, because this is where our pancreas comes into play. The pancreas monitors our blood sugar levels and releases insulin in order to control it. But your body can't metabolize sugar as fast as you eat it. So if you consume more sugar than your body currently needs, then the liver stores it in the form of glycogen. The current recommended daily allowance of added or free sugar is on screen now. Then when your body needs it, the liver breaks this glycogen down and releases the sugar into the bloodstream to keep your blood sugar level constant. Although sugar essentially powers the cells that keep our bodies alive, eating too much sugar can instead lead to a whole host of health problems. You see, our livers can only store 90 to 100 grams of glycogen. Anything over this is converted to fat. So, what happens when kids consume sugar? Surely it works differently. They're too little for all that candy and cake. It hypes them up and sends them on a sugar-fueled fun spree. We've all seen the sugar rush happen. So what other explanation is there? Well, several studies have been conducted to see what effect it does have on kids. The link between hyperactivity and sugar became the subject of interest to scientists back in the 1970s. Allergist Dr. Benjamin Feingold conducted research into food preservatives and synthetic additives and their relationship to hyperactivity in kids. This research led to the publication of the Feingold diet. Although this diet didn't explicitly advise eliminating sugar, it did suggest parents avoid artificial colorings and flavorings in their children's diet to reduce hyperactivity. The common association of sugar with these additives is believed to have led to the current conclusion that sugar also equals hyperactivity. But Feingold's theory has since been discredited by more recent research, and it's believed the reduction in hyperactive behavior was as a result of the increased attention the parents gave their children in order to follow the strict diet, and not the elimination of food additives. Fast forward to 1982, when the United States National Institutes of Health claimed that it had been scientifically proven that there's no link between sugar and hyperactivity. Yet, the idea of the sugar rush continued to gain traction among mothers and fathers alike. Kids were still going crazy at sugar-saturated parties and having the inevitable crash shortly after, where the pure elation of the sugar rush is replaced with tears and screams and damnation to anyone who denies them of their next sugar fix. Subsequently, there were numerous studies that followed through the 1990s, examining the effects of sugar on kids. Dr. Mark Woolreich from the Oklahoma University Health and Sciences Center was one of many scientists who conducted such experiments. In 1994, Woolrich and other researchers examined two groups of preschool children. Each family were given a strict diet to follow for three weeks at a time. One diet was high in sugar, while the other two diets were high in aspartame and saccharin, both artificial sweeteners used as a sugar substitute. In this study, neither the children, the parents, nor the researchers knew which child was on what diet at any one time. At the end of the study, behavioral and cognitive tests were conducted and feedback was gathered from the parents, babysitters, the children's teachers, and the researchers. In the older children, aged six to 10, the evaluation showed there was no change in their behavior no matter what diet they followed. In the younger children, aged three to five, there was evidence that actually suggested the children's behavior improved while on the sugar diet. Some evaluations even indicated 
that the sugar diet made the children calmer during certain tests. So believe it or not, all the evidence indicated that sugar is not a trigger for children's hyperactivity. This was followed by the most comprehensive study on the subject in 1995. Published in the Journal of American Medical Association, it collated and analyzed a total of 23 reports and studies, with the objective to determine the effects of sugar on the behavior or cognition of children. The 23 reports covered a range of approaches including different sugar qualities and placebos, and in some cases the conditions were kept secret from the children, their parents, and even the researchers in order to cancel out any bias. And the conclusion? The studies to date found that sugar does not affect the behavior or cognitive performance of children. In fact, the statistician who analyzed all 23 studies claimed he had never seen such constantly negative results, meaning that sugar continuously failed to make kids hyper. As solid as this evidence seems, there have been other tests that indicate sugar can influence children's behavior, at least to some extent. A study by Dr. Tamberlane from Yale University involved an experiment that showed sugar can boost adrenaline levels. Dr. Tamberlane reported that when sugar is quickly absorbed into the bloodstream, it creates a spike in blood sugar levels, which can lead to higher adrenaline levels, and temporarily cause symptoms identified in hyperactivity. So, even though some of these studies were conducted decades ago, why do people still regularly refer to the sugar rush as a matter of fact. Well, this is down to our preconceptions. The expectation of the effect clouds our judgment and means we see what we want to see, regardless of whether it is happening or not. The reality is that kids are essentially just high on life, and it's more the environment that's to blame than the food. A study cited in the Journal of Abnormal Child Psychology in 1994 put this idea to the test. 35 boys aged 5 to 7 whose parents claimed their behavior was sensitive to sugar were gathered together for a study. The children's parents were told that some of the kids were given a large dose of sugar and that the remaining boys had been given placebos, when really all the children had been given placebos. The study then observed the interaction between the parents and their children. Those who had been told their sons had consumed a large dose of sugar rated their children to be more significantly hyperactive than those they were told had been given the placebo. The parents also tried to maintain more control over these children. They criticized them more, watched them more, and maintained a closer proximity to their children. The supposed sugar hadn't changed the boys' behavior, but instead it had changed their parents. But there is still another factor to consider. Studies have revealed that the love for candy and all things sweet is actually hardwired into children. The basic biology of the child is that they don't have to learn to like sweet or salt. It's there from before birth. Dr. Manella from the Monel Chemical Senses Center explains that a child's desire for sweet, high-calorie foods may have been an evolutionary feature that sought to supply their bodies with the calories needed for a period of rapid growth when food was scarce. In fact, and this is a key part to the entire argument of this video, Manella claims that sugar doesn't just taste good to children, it even makes them feel good. So much so that Manella's research has shown that it can actually relieve pain, and many hospitals now apply babies with sweet-tasting drinks to reduce pain during minor but painful procedures. This love for intense sweetness appears to exist up until late adolescence. And Sue Caldwell, a researcher from the University of Washington, has shown that kids almost have no limit to the level of sweetness they enjoy. Where adults prefer the sweetness of the average can of soda, children prefer at least twice this. Caldwell's research discovered that during the period of bone growth up until the ages of 15 to 16, the children's preferences was for sweet tastes. After this age, their bones had stopped growing and their taste preferences were much closer to adults. I don't know for sure, but I am very suspicious that the bones are somehow telling either the brain or the tongue that there is energy needed for their growth and signaling for that preference to increase. The actual science behind this is still unknown, but this could help explain the level of pleasure kids get from consuming sugar and consequently the sugar rush adults perceive. As for the sugar rush itself, the scientific community believes this matter has been pretty much put to rest. 
But there are still a few more studies that are currently attempting to establish a link between the increased consumption of sugar and the increased diagnosis of ADHD. But as it currently stands, this is only a correlation, and there is still no evidence that sugar has an impact on children's hyperactivity. With some parents, it's a belief, and no matter what we say, they are not likely to make a change. The best we can do is provide a good quality study and make them aware of it, and then let them make their own decision. So, even though sugar won't make you hyper, and kids may be naturally designed to want sweets instead of vegetables, in a modern world where calories are plentiful and sugar is in everything from bread to salads, it's important to remember how harmful eating too much of the sweet white stuff can be. As such, the overconsumption of sugar is one of the lead causes of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. And researchers say, if we want to reduce people's intake of sugar, then understanding the biology behind children's desire for it is the first step in tackling the problem. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. We can't thank you enough for giving us your support in helping our channel grow, but if you haven't already subscribed, then please do, and check out our other videos. See you next time.